The 1980s had given us Margaret Thatcher, the yuppies, materialism at all costs, and unfortunately, a growing economic burden that Maggie herself would not recover from. Today's video is a collaboration with Vanessa from Little Miss Budget in her series, 100 Years of Makeup. But today, I'm going to take us through the dark side of the 90s. Stay tuned. I am so happy to be filming this. This is actually the second attempt at filming this. The first time I was too tired, my words were jumbled and the look just wasn't coming together. So I ended up scrapping it. So uh, this is a little bit lastminute.com, but if you can hear the fan on at the moment, it's because right here in the UK, we're having a bit of a summer heat wave and it is roasting. So apologies for that. First of all though, before I go any further into the video, I've got to say a huge thank you to Vanessa from Little Miss Budget for actually uh, inviting me to be part of this collaboration. I have enjoyed this series that she has done on her channel so much. It's been so fun watching her create all the different looks that, that Ness has done. Um, and just being able to be part of it is really, really exciting for me. So I'm really, really grateful. Um, also, as you can see, I am doing the 90s. So I am in well, technically, the Sisters of Mercy was an 80s band, but it kind of was still around in the 90s. So I am doing a 90s alternative look. Now, this isn't going to be strictly goth, because Sisters of Mercy have always said they're not a goth band, although they are. And it's not going to be from any particular genre. So when we look back now at makeup in the 90s, there's kind of very firm lines between the different sort of subsets of makeup and that wasn't the case back in the day yes there was the sort of preppy trendy look that you had you know the Britney Spears the Christina Aguilera the the bright pale blue eyeshadow with the glitter all up here very monochromatic lots of highlighter lots of nudie lips there was that look there was also that sort of slightly more glammed up supermodel look, the Cindy Crawford look of the 90s. That was sort of like the epitome of 90s glam. And then you had this sort of alternative scene. Now, a lot of people, when they do sort of 90s nostalgia videos and they look at the alternative makeup scene, they will go, this is a goth makeup. This is a metal makeup. This is grunge. And the reality is that actually, at the time, it was just not the mainstream. So if you were in the goth scene back in the 90s, yes, there were some people that had the pale white face with the black eyeliner and the sort of Egyptian Nefertiti type sort of, you know, designs going on. Um, and you had that, but that was the extreme. It wasn't the norm, even on the alternative scenes. And so that's what I'm wanting to do today. I want to create a look that is pretty much what my 90s self wished that I was able to wear at the time. Now, obviously I'm trans. Back in the 90s, I was just coming of age. I wasn't out as trans. Um, I was wearing makeup and doing things, but it was very much mainstream. Okay, so I was, I was at the time, I was discovering my alternative self, but I was still within my mainstream bubble. So maybe I'd use, you know, a bit of really thick black eyeliner, but then people would go like, oh, Britney. And I'd be like, mm -hmm, okay even though it was for, you know, more metal and grunge sort of looks. Um, but that was kind of more in the later 90s. The look I'm going for today is going to be very much inspired by that mid 90s kind of melting pot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the 90s as I go through this look. But first of all, I wanted to say that a lot of the makeup I'm using today isn't from the 90s because that would all be 30 years old and disgusting. So I'm not going to use 30 year old makeup, but I have got a couple of items that were either released in the 90s or were very, very popular, were key makeup items from the 90s that are still being produced today. So we're going to go through some of that. Also, I'm going to give you some 90s facts, a little bit of a factoid here and there as we go through the look. So if that sounds like something you'll be interested in, please do hit the thumbs up button, hit that subscribe button and then ding your bell so that YouTube notifies you each and every time I upload a video. Also down in the description box will be links to Ness's channel. There should be a card coming up just here to the video that she's done for her part of this collaboration as well. So do please go and check those out. 
Facts from 1990. Following a period of time where the Prime Minister was seen as basically a lame duck and lots of people have been calling for the Prime Minister to resign, they eventually did and were replaced without an election and just somebody else took over as Prime Minister. This is also the time that the economic downturn and recession was really kicking in. Is this the 90s or is this this week? No, apparently it is the 90s. So yeah, Thatcher was out, John Major was in, poll tax riots were the cause of that and also you know Thatcher um and then we we went into an economic downturn and a recession as for music let's get into the top 10 so in number 10 we have snap and the power in number nine England and new order because they did the um the football thing where Gaza cried I can't remember um but yeah that happened Madonna's Vogue was in 1990 as well that was the number eight bestseller in the UK Dub Be Good To Me by Beats International Tank Fly Bus Walk Jam Nitty Gritty you're listening to the boy from the big bad city this is Jam Hut that was at number seven in the UK Show Me Heaven by Maria McKee I don't actually remember that one that's a new one but that apparently was in at number six Holding On at number five was Killer by Adamski otherwise known as Seal and that other music producer who I also can't remember um, Ice Ice Baby Vanilla Ice was in at number four If There's a Problem Yo I'll Solve It check out the hook while my DJ revolves it uh, Sacrifice Alton John that is back isn't it it's only just come back but yeah Elton John was at number three. Sinead O'Connor with Nothing Compares to You and that was it done in one take? The answer is no. But was it done in one take video where she cried? That was in at number two. But the number one best-selling single in 1990 was Unchained Melody by the Righteous Brothers. And boy, does that give me all sorts of feels. It really does. If you notice, not one of those tracks is from an alternative band, indie band or anything like that. But there you go. That was what was happening in 1990. So then let's get into today's look. So first of all, primers. Now, obviously, you know how much I love the Jekyll Black Glow Drops, but this is a fairly recent invention. In fact, most primers are fairly recent inventions. So... We're not going to use that today. Now, there were primers around during the 90s, but these were very much part of the makeup artist's kit. Um, they were starting to come through in some of the higher end kind of makeup lines. But generally, for those of us that were just going along to Boots or Superdrug and getting our makeup from the drugstores, there weren't primers. They just weren't a thing yet. They were starting to come in but not over to sort of the mass market. So we're not going to use a primer today. Now, I have got a little bit of moisturiser on, but I've tried to kind of use minimal amounts of even skincare today to really represent kind of how my skin and how things would have been in the 90s. I haven't used the clearer seal. I, I haven't gone in with, you know, that really bad astringent to strip my skin, which is what I was doing in the 90s because, you know, acne i was a teenager um for part of it anyway um so foundation wise again i'm not going to go back and use old foundations certainly not um but i'm also not going to go and get some makeup uh, formulas that i can't use on the daily so i'm i'm kind of this is inspired by 90s some of these products were around in the 90s these two weren't um but i'm going for a kind of mix now i have a memory of foundation being quite thick but also not what we would call full coverage today so sort of like a medium coverage um now i know that back in the day so anyway, i'm gonna i'm gonna put some foundation on so i've got the maybelline fit me and the revolution matte base i'm gonna kind of mix the two together and get quite a pale foundation because I am quite pale and because I am going for a slightly more alternative look so I'm just going to put a blob of that on the back of my hand and then equally a blob of the revolution one and then I'm just going to use my finger to oh I've got a lot of this left actually I'm then going to use my finger to uh, mix the two together and apply now makeup application back in the 90s was very much hands-on you basically applied it using clean hands now that's what I'm going to do today um because you know we're, we're going for that sort of 
authentic or as authentic as we can 90s kind of feel today. So there were puff puffs around. Um, obviously they'd been around since the sort of first days of foundation products really. But for most people, when you were applying, I'll put a little bit more foundation on. For most people, when you were applying your foundation in the 90s, we just use our fingers. We just use clean hands and you put a little bit on and you would kind of blend it just like this and you would you know put it over your eyelids and kind of just put a layer on like that um and then that would be you done that was pretty much your base more 90s facts for you now 1991 we're not going to go music we're not going to go politics we're going to talk about films so then the top 10 best-selling films in the uk of 1991 were at number 10, Hot Shots. That's really interesting. I don't actually think I've seen it. I know it's the spoof of all of those Top Gun type films that were around in the late 80s. So yeah, Hot Shots was in at number 10. The rest of these I have seen though. So number nine was The Addams Family. Finally, a bit of alternative culture coming in. Uh, number eight was Arachnophobia. Good film, can't watch it, too scary. Uh, number seven, The Commitments. Number six, The Naked Gun, two and a half, The Smell of Fear. That's the full title. Uh, number five, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, number four was Three Men and a Little Lady, which does not have the ghost child. That was in Three Men and a Baby. If you don't know what I'm looking, uh, what I'm talking about, Google it. Uh, the third biggest selling film in the UK was Dances with Wolves. Now that was a surprise to me. That was a massive surprise to me. But the biggest surprise is the top two films. I probably would have said, if I'd known these were all out in, the, in 1991, I probably would have said that these were in the top 10. I would not have put them in this order though. So the second biggest film of 1991 in the UK, and this was at 18 and a half million pounds back then, was Terminator 2. The top selling film, which actually made nearly or one and a half, 1.6 million pounds more was Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Bigger than Terminator 2. That was a surprise. In the 90s, you would still set your face with a little bit of powder. The powders that you used were very similar to today. So like your press compacts, things like that. Now, certainly on the alternative scene, you would often see people using the whites like this one. Um, and again, it would be with a puff puff or one of those really little thin, bad sort of square sponges that used to come with the sort of um, with the compacts. Now, this is just a standard puff puff. Um, now, brushes were a thing. But again, generally speaking, for most people during the 90s, uh, it was only the makeup artists that really used a lot of brushes. And even then, a lot of the makeup artists were using those sponge tip applicators, which you can still get in a lot of sort of eyeshadow quads and things like that these days but anyway i'm going to go through now and just kind of set my face with this pale powder now do bear in mind i am going for that slightly more alternative look um and it's the a mid 90s look that i'm kind of recreating today just to put it in its sort of historical context so i've got my foundation and my base on so let's start going on to eyes and eyeshadow now i am not about to sit here and put my face on with a sponge tip applicator. I'm sorry, I am all for historic accuracy. I, ca I just cannot do that to myself. So I'm not gonna do that. So I am gonna use my brushes. In terms of eyeshadows, certainly on the alternative scenes, there weren't really the big indie brands. So it wasn't a case of, you know, I'm not gonna use Maybelline, I'm gonna use KVD, or I'm gonna use, you know, a any other indie alternative kind of themed brands. That wasn't really the case back then. There were companies like Stargazer that was doing things like these sort of single shadows um, that were using much more brighter, but these were very much only available in alternative sort of shops. These weren't really available for people in the mainstream. So, so when you went into super drugs and again, boots and places like that, you were quite limited as to the eyeshadow concept. So they were quads, they were small little palettes. We didn't really have the big rainbow palettes that we've got today or the big sort of multi phase or you know like sort of the uh, Jeffree Star orgy or cremated where you go from like a, a, a white to a black with all of those shades in between. 
that wasn't really a thing. So if you were looking for these sort of alternative shades, you really had to kind of, you know, pick up a palette here or a little quad there and use one shade from this and one shade from that and kind of mix and match. So that's kind of what I'm going to do a little bit of today. But also I'm, I'm kind of going in for two different palettes that I'm going to be using as my, my staples. So one of them is the Kat Von D Shade and Light palette. Uh, this is, you know, 100 million years old. So I'm going to start off using this because it's got these sort of browns and a couple of sort of whites and a black there right in the middle. Some facts from 1992, I'm going to include some famous people that died in 92. Okay, so these are in no particular order. I'm not putting them in date order or anything else or order of importance. I've just got a few names that I'm going to talk about. So Isaac Asimov died in 1992. He was a massive impact on my life in terms of science fiction because he impacted the sci-fi world like no other writer arguably. So ideas like the first rule of robotics which we still see in things like Terminator and lots of other franchises has now become one of the standard we don't build AI which is capable of killing us. Lots of things like that were originally an Isaac Asimov invention. The incredible Marlena Dietrich died in 1992. Uh, an incredible actress, very very famous iconic movie actress. Um, just amazing, amazing. Go back and watch any of her old films. Absolutely breathtaking. You cannot take your eyes off the screen when she's on screen. Um, comedian Benny Hill, problematic these days, but he died in 1992. He was actually born in the same town as me. Denim Elliott, the English actor, died of an AIDS-related illness in 1992, as did Anthony Perkins. Now, both of these actors only went public with their HIV status right towards the end of their lives. It was really much a taboo subject then, pretty much similar as it is today, unfortunately. A lot of people in the 90s that did pass away of HIV and AIDS, not just famous people, but people in general, had on their birth certificate the cause, but it would say something like pneumonia. It wouldn't say HIV or AIDS related or anything else. It would just say pneumonia um, because there was still a stigma attached to that, which unfortunately is still around today. The 6th of July saw the 30th anniversary of the passing of this next person I'm going to talk about, and that is Marsha P. Johnson. Now, she was a black trans woman born in 1945 in the States in New Jersey. She was one of the people that was there at the Stonewall riots in 1969 and started the gay liberation movement. So what we now know of as the LGBTQ movement, the community, all of that, Marsha P. Johnson was one of those key influential people there at the time. And unlike others on this list, she didn't die of natural causes. She was actually murdered. Um, and I'm getting choked up because it is really hard to talk about this case. Um, but she was an influential black woman, very poor, no money, like seen as the lowest of the low of the low in all aspects of her life but she was influential in my life as a trans woman and in many people the reason that we celebrate pride today is because of those people at the stonewall riots because they stood up and started to take back their rights and marsha p johnson was one of those key people and if you're wondering what the p in her name stands for it stands for pay it no mind. It was a catchphrase that Marsha P. Johnson had, which basically said, if somebody spits at you or hates you, pay it no mind. Don't let it affect you. Um, and so, yeah, Marsha P. Johnson. And she was an inspiration, not just to many back then, but in today's LGBTQIA plus movement as well. To get that real sort of alternative, grungy, slightly gothy look that I'm going for today, I am going to use this palette and I'm going to start off by going in with this pale shade just here. So it's kind of like an ivory shade. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place that all over my upper mobile lid. So basically between my eyelid itself and up to my brow. So the whole brow bone area. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because yes, the alternative culture, alternative scene in the 90s didn't really go for the whole like baby blue eyeshadow all the way up to your eyebrows like the Britney Spears of the day. However, there was still that impact of highlighting the brow bone. That was still something that was around, but it was much more on the alternative scene. It was much more that sort of matte effect rather than having the sort of the beaming highlighter that others in the more mainstream used to use. So I'm also just applying it 
on the inner corner as well, just to highlight this area. You might have noticed there's no eye primer. Again, a bit like general face primers, eye primers weren't really a thing back in the day. Um, it's a reason why, if you look back at some of the nostalgic pictures from red carpets and things, a lot of the makeup looks really kind of insipid. It looks really sort of like meh, because there wasn't the sort of uh, products that we've got these days that really latch onto colour and really like emboldify it's a word trust me those eyeshadows so it was just the powder on your face on its own and invariably throughout the day it would fade so hopefully that's not going to happen too much during today's look next up i'm going for one of the brown shades and i think i'm going to go for this one here now if you weren't using sort of browns you could use something that's got a bit more of a pinky tone if you wanted to sort of recreate this look but all i'm doing is just going to run this very lightly across the um, crease line really just to kind of give it that almost sunken in shadow look as you can see uh, and I'm not adding it too thickly I'm not going for too much color I, I want it to be slightly washed out because I really do want to get that sort of that proper alternative grunge-esque kind of vibe today 90s facts 1993 edition so the costs of housing in the 90s was quite sort of in flux um in the early 90s we, we were going into that economic downturn so it was quite stable from sort of 1991 through to 95 96 it was only in the late 90s that prices started to really rise so the average sort of house price between 1990 and 1993 was something in the region of 58 to 59 thousand pounds and that is twice as much as that same house would have cost in the mid to late 80s so you can see how much there had been a massive boom in the 80s and then house prices had stagnated now the average price of a pint of milk was 33 pence in 1993 compared to 55 to 60 pence for a pint of milk today now if the cost of housing had increased at the same price as a pint of milk your average size house in the uk would set you back about 120,000 pounds in today's money however the average housing price in the uk in 2022 is 278,000 pounds so you can see not everything has increased at the same rate so now because I've got them available to me, I'm just going to use one of these brushes. Again, a slight dig at the sponge tip applicators, but I'm just going to use one of these sort of packing brushes and I'm going back in with that same shade and I'm just lightly touching in, as you can see, just very lightly. I don't want too much makeup on my brush. And then what I'm going to do is just go underneath. I know I haven't got the rest of the eye look done yet, but I just want to go underneath the eye line on the lower lash line and just kind of almost smoke that down. And then I'm going to take a clean, fluffy blending brush and just sort of blend that out a little bit more. Okay, now so from this palette, I'm going to go in with this darker brown just here. And this is quite a cool tone brown. And I am just going to apply this again on the mobile lid, but taking it up to that crease line. And just kind of the topper part of that mobile lid if you like to so just kind of almost pre-smoking this up and then i'm just going to apply with whatever's left on the brush and just take that and just take that again up into that crease line just to kind of enhance it a little bit i don't want to change the color too much but i want to darken it up just a little touch so while I'm doing this, I'm going to give you some 1994 facts. Well, except I'm not. I'm going to tell you about one of my favourite films of all time that came out in 94. While I'm doing that, I'm just tapping in with this black shade just here. And I am loading this up. Now, this is, again, quite a fluffy brush. But I am going to load this up quite quite intensely as you can see look how dark that's gone 1994 saw the release of a film which for me is still on my every year rewatch list and that is the crow i absolutely love it i've got a crow tattoo i absolutely love that film it was brandon lee's final film he actually tragically passed away uh, as a result of an injury that he received on set he was actually shot um, by another actor who had been given a gun. Now, 
at the time, it, the, the, his death actually led to some major changes in Hollywood. Now, during the production of The Crow, a decision had been made to use live bullets and to actually adapt live bullets. Now, this was quite common in Hollywood at the time. You would basically, to save money on blanks, you would take your main bullet, remove the actual bullety part from it, and either totally remove the gunpowder or just, you know, adapt it in some way to make it safe. Now, this was standard practice, as I say, at the time, but unfortunately something had got lodged in the casing, in the barrel of the gun. And when the actor was handed a gun with this safe uh, blank bullet in and fired it at, at Brandon Lee, unfortunately, the, the piece that had got lodged in the barrel that nobody knew was there, then got sent and it basically hit Brandon Lee and killed him. Um, and he, he died. And it was absolutely shocking and the film actually shut down the film was due out in 1992 it basically was was being made during the early part of the 90s it, it based on a comic by James O'Barr and had been this ongoing sort of production problem until Brandon Lee came on board and then all of a sudden there started to be this momentum with the film um, and then when he was tragically killed the, the film got scrapped. They they literally scrapped the film. Alex Price, the, the director, basically said, I can't I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. This is no, no, no. And it took Brandon's family and the other filmmakers and lots of other people around to persuade the director to actually try and and finish the film. And they did this by all sorts of film trickery. So there were some scenes that used um, other images of other actors from the back and things, uh, body doubles. There were some scenes that had been shot for one part of a film that got moved. And there's actually some test footage that had been filmed on video that they took into a computer. Now this is this is 93 when they're doing the CGI on this. So this was way back at a time when, you know, it's not like nowadays where you can create almost anything in a computer. This was real sort of groundbreaking stuff. And so there's a few sh uh, shots in the film where they take this video footage and they basically cut it and splice it and adapt it and put layers over the top. And then they use that as other footage. And this one scene I'm talking about in particular was actually filmed in an alleyway. Um, and it was one of the scenes where Brandon Lee's character is wet and walking down this alleyway covered in rain, shivering in the cold. And they move this bit to a different part of the story to have him in, in an attic. In, in the film, he punches the mirror and you see sort of there's a crack and in the reflection, you can see it is basically Brandon Lee. And then from behind, we see how Eric Draven, the character, is basically grabbing the bits of makeup and applying it. And then we see uh, Brandon Lee in the full crow makeup. Now that shot of him in the mirror is this shot from the alleyway. And the reason that the, the, the character punches that mirror and it's cracked is because it was hiding the fact that it was a very poor quality video test footage that they then reused and there's all sorts of bits like that during the film uh, whole characters and whole storylines were dropped because they obviously couldn't film an interaction with Eric Draven and those characters but obviously at the time there was a massive feeling of goodwill from the actors from the filmmakers they wanted to get this film finished as a tribute to Brandon Lee and now nearly 30 years after the film came out it is still heralded as a classic piece of fantasy fiction um let's not talk about the reboots but certainly for my life i discovered the crow and it was at a pivotal time so in 1994 i was 18 years of age and i discovered this film with an amazing soundtrack with an amazing story with an amazing actor who i instantly fell in love with as i think anybody who's ever watched the film does because he is so magnetic on camera and for me that became one of my pivotal moments if you like in my in my growing up into being who I am today and kind of reinforced this alternative scene that I was already kind of starting to go down if you haven't watched The Crow, then unfortunately we just can't be friends. We can't. I'm sorry, I'm not having it. If you haven't even seen it, you can you can have watched it and not liked it. That's fine. But if you have never seen The Crow, we cannot be besties. So I would urge you very, very strongly to go and watch that film at your earliest opportunity. It is amazing. It's very much part of the, its time, part of the 90s zeitgeist. But go and watch it. It is a classic piece of cinema.
So I'm going back in with that packing brush and I'm taking a little bit more of the black from this palette. I'm only really using this Kat Von D palette, aren't I? Um, and I'm taking it really, really thick and I'm just going to apply that on the sort of, I guess across the lash line of the mobile lid, but to really deepen up that black, as you can see. More 90s facts, and again, this is from 1995, and we're going to look at music again. So, I've got the top five singles from 1995 for you. So, in fifth position, and bear in mind, this is in the UK only. So, in the fifth position was Celine Dion with Think Twice. Love that song. Uh, in fourth position, I'm happy about this, Take That and Back For Good. If I remember, I'll try and find out before the end of this video, I'll try and find my Take That earrings that I still have from... Probably around about this time. I know that I was so alternative that I rocked a pair of Take That earrings. Anyway, um, in third position was Robson and Jerome. Now, they were two actors. Uh, Jerome Flynn is actually, or was actually, in Game of Thrones. Um, but Robson and Jerome were in a series in the UK called Soldier Soldier. And they went on and released a, an album, I think maybe even two albums. Um, and had a, like a, a, a five second pop career, um, which was, you know good for your mum I guess mums and grannies liked it I, I wasn't a fan um but in the third position they had the song which was called I believe stroke up on the roof it was a double side a double a side so I believe and up on the roof was in number three position the second biggest seller of 1995 was Gangster's Paradise by Coolio I mean that just blows my mind that is absolutely amazing but the weirdest music fact of 1995 is what was in it number one. Because this was also number one in 1990. It is Unchained Melody. But in 1990, it was the original by the Righteous Brothers. In 1995, it was re-recorded and was a massive, massive chart topper for Robson and Jerome. Yep, they have two of the biggest selling singles of 1995. And they were two actors who just recorded an album. Yeah, go figure. So I'm just smudging this out ever so slightly. Not really smoking it. It really is just to smudge the black out. Um, and to kind of get that slightly, I guess, slightly slept in look. I'm going to go in with some eyeliner. This is a MAC eyeliner pencil. Um, now, again, back in the, the, the 90s, I loved MAC. I got into using a little bit of MAC when I could afford it and I would save up and, and take a trip to Debenhams to go to the MAC counter specifically. Um, now I really like MAC, still to this day I use some MAC products. Now back in the day you could buy cheap alternatives, so you could buy things like Collection 2000, there were lots of other uh, drugstore brands that had decent eyeliner uh, pencils, but for me a MAC black pencil, not only was it really nice and black, but it also was smudgeable, and that was a key thing, especially for the sort of grungy, alternative -y, gothy type looks. Yes, you could get liquid eyeliner, but the people that were able to use a liquid eyeliner back in the 90s were, were like some kind of gods. Because to get that on, without YouTube teaching you, or without, you know, having all the information that's at our, our fingertips now with the internet, without any of that, the people that were able to do a really nice, bold, fine black line, they were legends. They were absolute legends. For the rest of us, it was a case of you take your pencil, you do your best, you smudge it out, and you pretend that that smudginess was what you wanted, because that was pretty much all that we were able to do. Um, now, certainly in the alternative scene, this was a look. Um, and again, it's because... You have things like the supermodels doing that sort of heroin chic, as it was d dubbed. So they had to be super thin, super skinny, with sunken in um, sort of eyes, and that whole sort of look where they, they the waif look was coming in with the supermodels, um, and that was influencing media across the board. But certainly for the for the alternative cultures, like that that sunken eyed look was doable with the makeup. But this, this idea of your makeup should look lived in, it almost, you wanted to look like you'd been out for a party the night before, had woken up mid-afternoon the day after the party, and had just gone out again. That was kind of what you wanted to look like, that, oh, I don't really care about this. And you would spend hours and hours and hours getting just the right amount of, I don't care about my makeup smudginess. Um, which is what I'm now, now doing now. I know, right? So let's just do this on the other eye as well. 
Now, for me personally, I discovered the band I'm wearing, the t-shirt I'm wearing now. I discovered Sisters of Mercy in 1992. I remember it very vividly. Um, I was 16. I was at a friend's and she was into Sisters. She was a bit older than me. She was into the Sisters of Mercy. And I discovered this music and I was just like, I love this sound. I absolutely love it. What is this? Um, and it was the time I'd go around to her. She had a, a computer, like a, a, a decent spec computer. So I'd go around to hers and I'd play Doom and Doom 2. Oh my God. I spent hours having Sisters of Mercy on the soundtrack, playing Doom 2 with the BFG gun and all sorts. Absolutely loved it. Whilst we were talking about sci-fi and life and I was coming out and all of those things. Ever since then, Sisters of Mercy have been, they've been a band that I have enjoyed i've seen live numerous times i've enjoyed the music don't necessarily agree with a lot of things the band say these days but i thoroughly enjoyed uh their back catalogue and i still do now i know what you're thinking you're thinking lisa you said you were going to smudge out the eyeliner and you haven't done that yet i know because i need to find the proper tool to do the smudging and the proper tool that we used to use back in the day was your finger slightly lick your finger and then you take it And you just smudge it. Um, right, now this black eyeliner also comes in really handy for the next part of my makeup, which is my eyebrows. So historically, uh, people used to shave off their eyebrows throughout history and, and put them back on. Um, but it was really the punk movement that sort of brought that more into the mainstream alternative mainstream but really brought that more into the more mainstream modern day um so from the 70s and the 80s you know you would find people shaving everything off apart from like the little the the, the first the the core the tail the the root if you like um but the rest of it would all be gone and that still was happening in the 90s um the 90s was the decade of the overplucked eyebrow if you're on the alternative scene you would just shave them off completely and reapply with a pencil so that's what i'm going to do 90s facts 1996 edition so in 1996 various things happened that again were quite pivotal in my life so the film the craft came out we all know about the film the craft i i still haven't been able to watch the, the reboot, but the craft brought witchcraft into the mainstream like it had never been before. Yes, there'd been other sort of witchy things on telly and other witchy things, but nothing from this sort of counterculture alternative scene that was then played as kind of normal. So this element of we are the weirdos, mister, that celebration of being a weirdo, that was something that was pivotal for me, again, personally, in 1996. Okay, let's do the eyebrows. Now, the most important thing about getting genuine, absolute recreation of mid-90s eyebrows is your pencil sharpener. You want to get your pencil and you want to pop it in the fat bit of your double pencil sharpener, right? Now, this is really, really important. If you put it in the thin bit of your double pencil sharpener, the end gets so thin and pointy that you literally go to apply it and it will snap off. What you want is that kind of nice, chunky, uh, sharpened end, right? This is how you do it. And then it's very simple. I'm going to lean forward and show you. Are you ready for this? This is going to, this is going to take so much effort. Are you ready? So we start at the tail, at the base point, And we take it across. And then... We do that. And that's kind of it. That is it. That is it. The one line, the single line. I am going to darken it up slightly. Just in the front portion. So you kind of wanted your eyebrows to be mega thin and almost Vulcan. Almost Vulcan. You, you kind of, there is an arch. But it's not like a shaped arch that comes out. No, 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 no. You just want it to go up and down. That's it. Kind of almost like a Vulcan straight up, but just with that hint of a curve there. Um, and then this is the hardest bit of all, right? Getting sisters, not twins, as we say. However, back in the day, I didn't really care about that. So if your eyebrows were like this, and they weren't quite matching. Again, who cares? 
who cares? I mean, you could, <laughs> it could be argued actually that these days I have the same attitude. Um, but that's because these days part of my, like one side of my face has fallen and the other side hasn't. So my eyebrows are now permanently a little bit mismatched. But back in the day, it was done with makeup and that was what we did, right? So just, just, just accept it. Um, now, if you had brows, certainly on the alternative scene, if you had brows and couldn't shave them off because of work, there weren't really the options like you have nowadays of laminating and fluffing them and everything else. If you couldn't get rid of them fully, you would kind of pluck them as thin as you can so you have that thin look and then you would go in with the black pencil and properly like make these dramatic eyes and these dramatic sorry brows um and that would be kind of your way of doing it you could cover them up with a bit of foundation i remember a friend of mine um from the late 90s from the from the club scene who would who would just put wet foundation over her eyebrows and then not really set them or not really even wait for them to dry but then would try and carve in the shape of a brow over that wet foundation and you would kind of have this this bit where the the nib of the pencil would cause this divot and so you would have this line and then just underneath there would be this crusty kind of dried foundation where she'd push the, the pencil in so deep that there was this crust underneath and she rocked it she loved it oh my god i've just remembered that for the first time that's now making me smile ah I'm not going to name names. I nearly named names. I'm not going to. But wow, the things we did. And in fact, you see how I was about to go in and, and, and neaten up this brow? I'm not going to. Let's go for the authentic. Let's go for the Lisa's authentic attitude in the 90s. We'll, we'll just leave it like that, right? Just leave it like that. 1990s facts, 97 edition. So 1997 was, oh my God, such a major, major year here in the UK. Lots of things happened. Um, after years, years and years and years of the Tories being in Parliament, Labour actually started to make some major gains. And when we get into 1997, Labour had elected Tony Blair as their leader. Uh, the Conservatives had John Major, who was very much, I mean, he was depicted on Spitting Image using a grey puppet. He was just seen as grey and boring, not very exciting. It came out years later that before he was actually Prime Minister, he'd been having an affair with another Tory minister and that all came out afterwards and was a bit more exciting but the spitting image idea was more peas Norma he was very grey very boring and that was up against Tony Blair who was this sort of modern statesman like kind of politician for Labour and so in 1997 you had this massive upswing and Labour came in on a absolute landslide they'd come in with this theme song which was dreams things can only get better there was this real sort of feeling of new government new labor new hope and that was in the in the summer and then by august of 1997 a lot of that was dashed because on august bank holiday 1997 uh, Diana, the Princess of Wales, was killed in a car accident in France. And I remember exactly where I was when that happened. It's one of those, again, pivotal moments in history. Um, I'd been out and I uh, had basically uh, hooked up with somebody. And we were, we were doing whatever you do when you hook up with someone. And the radio was on. And the radio was interrupted with the first of the news stories coming in that there had been an incident involving Diana in France. And we were both like, oh, that doesn't sound good. And then slowly over the course of the night and over the course of the next, the morning and everything else, it came out that she'd passed away. And again, if you weren't there at the time, it's difficult to imagine how the entire country kind of went into mourning overnight. There are scenes of, of, of massive amounts of flowers and tributes that were, were, were placed, not just in, in London at the at Buckingham Palace, but across anywhere that had a royal connection or a Princess Diana connection, flowers were being left. I cannot in any way, shape or form imagine any other person in, in, in history having that much of an impact in their death. And partly that's because of the mass media 
that was obviously around in the in the mid 90s but also because of the the feeling and and the hope that we had as a country that things were going to get better and how princess diana had gone through this divorce she'd been part of the royal system she was very much seen as the underdog as seen as the victim in in you know charles having an affair and all of that and then all of a sudden for her not to be there just as she was embarking on a life away from the royal family it kind of pulled that rug and i would say that for 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 those two months or three months whatever it was in between labor coming in and tony blair having to do that speech about um diana's death that hopefulness was absolutely tanned you, you could feel it in the country and then when diana died a lot of that went um and again for the on the alternative scene there, there were people that loved the royals and people that hated the royals same as there is in every other circuit um but i remember i remember seeing goths crying like literally crying weeping having their makeup running down their face the minute that they were talking about diana and the funeral and all of that so yeah 97 is a year that i will never forget So now onto eyelashes. Now I'm using a product now that I had in the 90s. I remember it from the 90s. I didn't know it was still being made until fairly recently, actually. I think about a year or two ago. Um, and this is the Maybelline Great Lash Mascara. Look at this for iconic 80s, 90s packaging. I love the fact that it still looks the exact same. It has still got that sort of neon color story from back in the day they haven't updated it and i love that uh, so this is something that i absolutely used i used it when i was working in offices i used it when i was going out clubbing i use this all the time i use this all the time to give me that definition that i needed so let's go in and use this i love i love the fact this is still available right so you can see the wand the iconic sort of wand it's nothing compared to the ones that we have these days but back in the day this was this was an icon. It was an absolute icon and a legend. Do I rate it as one of my favourite mascaras these days? No. Um, but it still, as you can see, it still does the job. If you can hear any noises in the background, by the way, we've got the dogs in the lounge now. I've been filming this for so long that Rufus is now cooking dinner and the dogs are in after being out and playing all afternoon. They are now in. So if you can hear them eating and, and drinking and all of that stuff, it's just because it is now very late on on Saturday, the day that this is going up. I keep waffling and talking. Um, so, yeah, so that's why. So if you hear any noises in the background, just kind of ignore it. Right. More 90s facts, 98 edition. So then, in terms of box office, by the time we get to 1998, it seems we are very firmly in the era of disaster movies. Not like the Poseidon adventure that we had in the 70s and 80s and stuff, but we're back with disaster movies, but with a sort of modern sci-fi type of twist because we have the story of a very large meteor that is going to be heading towards earth and is going to cause a massive amount of damage and destroy everyone um and, and that actually appears twice so we have deep impact which was the seventh biggest film of 1998 but in the second place in the the second biggest film of 98 was another film about a giant meteor rock coming towards us and destroying us and that was armageddon uh, so it just seems that this was like the era of it because the number one film in 98 was probably the biggest disaster movie of all time that we all knew how it ends and that was Titanic. So yeah, if you're feeling really old, Titanic was from 1998. Leonardo and Kate Winslet fitting on that door. That argument first started 24 years ago and it is still around on TikTok and everything else, that is incredible to me. That is absolutely incredible. But 98 is also the year that Practical Magic came out. Now, I love the book, but I am a huge fan of the film. I, I love it. I really, really love that film. And again, it, it speaks to the witchy in me. 
For most of us, contouring wasn't really a thing that we did in the 90s. Again, it was a bit like primer. It was makeup artists, professionals. They were the ones that did the contouring. If you were lucky, you could get a little bit of a bronzer for, you know, warming up the skin, especially in the UK where we didn't get a lot of sun. These days with climate change, 30 years on and we're currently in a blooming heat wave. But back in the 90s, you, you never used to get quite as much contouring bronzing kind of products so i'm not going to do that especially on the alternative scene um when when i was entering into the goth and the alternative scene it, it it wasn't about we didn't want warm skin we wanted to look pale and interesting um and so yeah i'm not going to bronze or contour today what i am going to use is a little bit of a soft blush now this is actually one that wouldn't have even been that the brand wasn't around in the 90s it's revolutions uh, rhubarb and custard. Now I'm using this because it is just a soft blush, okay? So again, it's adding a little hint of colour without going overboard. And again, we I've just placed it up here as I would do these days, so I'm gonna have to put that on the same side. But actually, for blush, we, we kept it kind of on the apples. It was kind of in this area. So I'm just gonna put a little bit there. But I'm now going to top that with something that I remember doing in the 90s and that is taking whatever the setting powder was, taking it, I never used to put it on a brush, I used it on a puff puff, and basically just going over your blusher because again you kind of wanted this idea um, and to be fair the white setting powder that I used in the 90s was talc, okay, let's not beat around the bush. I use talcum powder. Please don't do that these days. Um, it's not good. It's not great. But I use talcum powder. So yeah, bear that in mind. But you would just put a little bit of um, a, a, your setting powder over the top of your blush to kind of tone it down. So you've got that hint of blushing through the makeup, but it's still being very kind of gothy alternative. And again, we will try and do it so it looks like I haven't put blusher on. No, I'm not wearing any blusher, she says. I've just got a little bit of powder on. If I'm blushing, it's coming from within. That's my natural blush. Because it was that whole kind of pared down, you don't want to look like you've done too much kind of look. 1999 facts, death edition. Stanley Kubrick died in 1999. Now, if you don't know who Stanley Kubrick is, he was a filmmaker of some of the biggest, most seminal films in history. So things like The Shining, Clockwork Orange, 2001. These are films that are immortalized as being up there with some of the best examples of, of, of what you can put on film. He's also allegedly the guy that filmed the fake moon landings, which we're not going to get into with that. That's a whole conspiracy theory. I'm not going into that. But yeah, Kubrick died in 1999. 99 is also the year that DeForest Kelly passed away. Now, you might not be familiar with his name, but you'll probably recognise his face or at least know of the character that he is most commonly associated with. And that is Leonard McCoy, Dr. McCoy from Star Trek. He was part of the holy trinity of Kirk, Spock, McCoy. He started off in this little sci-fi series that nobody knew if it was even going to get picked up, let alone be a hit, back in the mid-60s. And before you knew it, and then all the way through to the 90s, he was associated with Star Trek. He played the character in films, in audio books. He played the character on animated series, on shorts. You name it, he embraced the character of Dr. Leonard McCoy. He did other bits of work as well, but it's very much Leonard McCoy that uh, DeForest Kelly is going to be associated with forevermore. And in terms of sci-fi and that whole pantheon out there, um, yeah, he is up there with some of the most iconic actors ever to have graced to the silver screen. In terms of lipstick, I've got an iconic colour because really there was only one lipstick colour in the 90s and that was red. Lots of different brands were doing lots of different types of red. So Max Ruby Woo, I fell in love with in the 90s, but that isn't what I'm going to use today. I'm going to use a, a brand that's drugstore and so therefore quite affordable. But this particular shade epitomises the 90s because this shade was in all of this brand's advertising with a particular supermodel. That supermodel is Cindy Crawford. The brand is Revlon and the shade is 720. Now, if you know, 
you know. 720 Fire and Ice, this particular red was all the rage in the 90s. It's a slightly more orange red than I prefer. I prefer more of a blue red, like a deeper pillar box red, like this sort of color. This one is slightly more on the orange or pink side, as you can see if I hold it up against that. But this color was incredible in the 90s. You saw it everywhere because every time that Cindy Crawford was pictured, she would be wearing it. There were nail varnishes that had the exact same shade. Clothing was coming out with this same shade of red because this was becoming almost an iconic shade. Now this is not old, this is not a genuine 90s product, this is one that I bought fairly recently from Superdrugs because it is still doing the round. But again, this shade of red, if you look back at the pictures, you had a lot of the mainstream sort of celebs doing a very nude lip. The supermodels were very much into this sort of red and very deep red tones. And then on the alternative scene, you had people like Courtney Love rocking this same sort of red color. Um, so that's what I'm gonna go for today. So there you go. As you can see, that is a very bold red lip. And with this sort of eye look, it really does stand out. I'm gonna set my face, but I'm not using a setting spray. Uh, no. No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what we all did in the 90s. Yeah, it's hairspray. It's hairspray. I'm, I'm gonna hairspray my face. I know, I know. Right, so. I don't recommend that you do this at home, okay? Do not do this step at home, it is bad. This is designed to keep hair solidly in one place. It is not designed for your pores to be able to breathe through a layer of it like a setting spray is, but this is what I'm going to do in the interest of historical accuracy, okay? You ready? Now, obviously, back in the day, it would have been Elnet. I'm using the uh, La Cura version, um, but oof, that is quite scented um, and quite minging. Um, but yeah, so that's almost my look complete. I've got one more step to do, and then I'll be back. So there we go. That is the finished look. I've obviously just put my hair back a little bit, um, but the main thing I've just added in, and this is a slightly ironic twist, this is the genuine 1990s Take That earrings, um, made from 100% stainless steel, and yet they still look just as crap as they did back in the day. Now, because this is a collab with Ness, I've got to do this. which is how Ness always shows off her looks. Uh, if you don't know Ness and, and her channel, please go and check it out. Uh, the links will all be down below. They're always down below because she is part of the authentic army here on YouTube. Do go and check out Ness's video. I can't wait to see what she did with the theme of the 90s. That's gonna be, it wouldn't be interesting if she did a grunge look or if she went like really gothy. That would be really fascinating. So yeah, I urge you all to go and look at that. All of her channel links and the video link will be listed just down below in the description box. Let me know your thoughts on this look. Let me know your, your 90s looks. What were you looking like in the 90s? What was your makeup? In fact, you can always go across to my Instagram, which is just coming up on screen right now. Go and tag me in some photos of you in the 90s. I would love to see it. I genuinely would love to see it. And I bet we'll all have a giggle. Let me know if you've actually got any eyebrow hairs left, if you were around doing makeup in the 90s, I'm sure you'll probably end up with a brow not too dissimilar from this because once they were plucked your eyebrows were fucked. There's a video suggestion coming up just here and a subscribe button that is just there. Do all those things and I will see you on another video and as we always say stay you, stay true, stay authentic and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.